Today, guys, we are going to be jumping off of... Jumping off of... Jumping off of... Yes, yes. What's good, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Jumping Off Points, the podcast where me and my buddy Aiden use current events in the news as jumping off points to explore bigger issues in politics and culture. What are you saying, Aiden? I'm very good, Tim. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm doing dry January at the minute, so it's been a very easy, slow start to the year for me. Almost. I have nothing but respect. <laughs> nothing but respect for that. Almost bordering on a little bit boring, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good. I think How from conversations outside of the show, you've told me that it is boring, not just bordering <laughs> on it. You've been having a boring January. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just trying to just trying to play it cool for the audience. <laughs> yeah, I got I've got nothing but respect for you, man. And anyone who's uh, any of my dry warriors out there in this month, like for me, I guess I'm just I'm so antisocial anyway that if you take beer out of the equation, then I wouldn't do anything, and I'd have no <laughs> reason to see anyone. So. <laughs> Other people should be doing it, but not me. It's a great thing when other people, yeah, when, when V does it, but not for me. <laughs> okay, so what are we talking about today? So today we're going to talk about the broad um, industrial action sweeping across our country um, in various industries and public sector professions. Um, this is something that I think even if you're not from the UK, you will have caught wind of. I follow politics vicariously on Twitter and I just get the broad swathes of topics that come from lefty Twitter and this appears to be one of them over the last few months. Yeah, not only is there the just sort of direct impact of services not running because there's a lot of strikes happening all the time, but also it just kind of feeds into this bigger narrative that the country is broken or that things generally are not going well. We are broken. We're being referred to by other countries in Europe as, oh, we don't want to turn into that. I've seen yeah. that a lot, like from like German people and French people, like, oh, it could be like it is in the, in the UK. Look at the nightmare they're having. But yeah, so that's the topic of the show. Let's get <laughs> into it. Over kind of the second half of 2022 and now into 2023, we've seen strikes in rail, barristers, the postal service, healthcare, education. So a real broad selection of both public sector and some public services that are run by the private sector as well. So obviously the biggest background issue to all of this is the inflation crisis. In the UK, we are seeing levels of inflation that the highest rates they've been in 40 years. A lot of the strikes um, as their core reason for doing industrial action Uh, It's because their pay hasn't kept up with the demands of the inflation rates. So at the moment, do we have a figure on current inflation? Should we pluck it out of thin air or should we look it up? (laughs) I think it's about 10%, but let's I think it's 10 or 11. The consumer price index rose by 9.2% in the 12 months to December 2022. So yeah, almost 10%. Pay... I think in both the public and private sector have not kept up with that rate. Obviously, it would be ridiculous for them to keep up with that rate. Um, But especially in the public sector, wages have been lagging behind their counterparts, especially in the healthcare sector. They are very much understaffed and overworked. Um, We have conditions of work in a lot of these industries where people are working above and beyond their hours, but not being remunerated for that. So although pay is a big pillar of the strike action it's not the only thing the conservative government that we have in the uk is not keen to pander to the demands of the unions so what they are or what they've done is introduce a new bill and this is going to be our jumping off point of the day uh is the we need to have a little air horn for that or something don't we like a little jumping off point of the day is there like um what are the famous jumps that we know of that we could insert into this. I'm thinking of, you know, like, um, so there's Mario when he goes and hits a coin box, like, Bleh! oh yeah. Nice. But something that people could hear, we don't even need to explain it. It's just like, that's our jumping off point for the day. And then the, the sound effect plays and it's just people get it. It's like, oh, they're jumping off this topic. Boom. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, okay, we've discussed it now, but from episodes forward, we'll just play that sample, okay? So um, the government have passed a new piece of legislation called the Strikes Minimum Service Levels Bill. It is essentially aimed at restricting the ability of unions to go on strike and cause public disruption. 
it means that certain industries, so health services, fire and rescue, education, transport, decommissioning of nuclear installations and border security must all adhere to a minimum level of service set by the government in advance of a strike. So you have to give notice that you want to go on strike. Then the government will tell you what minimum service level is required. And then they will tell your employer and your employer will identify individual people who have to come into work when the strikes are on. And basically, if you don't, if you choose to go on strike, you can be fired and your union can be sued. It seems to me like it would completely curb unions' abilities to have any power when they strike. The whole purpose of a strike is to cause some level of disruption to service. Yeah, for sure. So if you're being told, well, actually, according to the law, we need to have a minimum level of you that can't strike, that means that you're only ever going to be disrupting service to a level the government can account for within its that budget. That deems acceptable. That they deem acceptable, which yeah. is going to be... Which is going to be very low, low level yeah. of disruption. And, and also, so like their, I guess one of their main justifications for this is that, for example, with ambulances and, and fire brigades and whatever, like if they don't have this minimum level of service, people will die, which, are, you know, there's some merit to that argument. But then they've also included transport services, education services. It's like, especially transport. Transport is, it's a private company if you can't get a train one day, no one's going to die. It's just annoying, yeah, isn't it? Like, it's true. In reality, what this bill is for is to get voters on side by, by the Tories showing that they're minimizing disruption to their lives because people don't like inconvenience. Yeah, of course. I can see this battle line being drawn already, actually, in terms of the way people talk about it. Um, there's a certain type of person who thinks that this is all kind of really pointless, the strikes. Um, and it's just people um, rabble rousing for no reason. A lot of those people are likely to be within the, the Tory sort of demographic. Yeah. So I think you're right. This is an attempt to appeal to those people, but also to take an action. The, the worst optics move would be if Rishi Sunak was seen to be doing nothing about it. Um, yeah. neither negotiating with the unions nor putting his foot down in a really assertive way. Yeah. So I think this this is leaning towards the latter of, well, this is the action we've taken and it should resolve things if if we're allowed to pass it. Well, I think they have passed it, yeah. Oh, it's but, already been passed? Um, yeah, it might still need to go through the Lords and all that stuff. It's made it through the House of MPs. And I remember there's someone said, uh, I can't remember which MP it was, but they said th it, it was them directly appealing to the House of Lords and saying, this has passed along a considerable margin. You need to do your duty and get it get it passed. I don't think the Lords will get in the way of this. The Tory majority in the House of Lords might even approve of this. You know, it's like yeah. classic union bashing uh, right. Margaret Thatcher stuff, isn't it? So I can imagine they'll probably be fairly on side. Well, that's really sad because I came into this episode thinking we had a cause to fight and now... <laughs> No, it's like, oh no, we're just reporting on it. Like, we're mourning the loss of rights now. When, specifically Grant Shapps, who is the business uh, secretary, this is kind of his bill. When I've heard him interviewed about this topic, and as well as like other people in the cabinet, what they've been saying is that this is not an unreasonable thing to do because there are several other countries with minimum service measures already in place, citing France, Italy, and Spain. But unions in those countries have rejected this comparison. They say that the labor rights in the UK are already much more restrictive than they are in the EU. It's much more difficult to go on strike here. And in many places in Europe, they have a fundamental right to strike. So yeah, it's not quite the same. Specifically in France, they passed minimum service level legislation in 2008, but the levels are agreed through negotiations with the unions, which is basically what happens now anyway with like essential services like nurses. They always have a negotiation and say, we will continue to work on the emergency ward or whatever. But in practice, in France, there's nothing that employers can do to force workers not to go on strike. It's more about unions have to give have to do that negotiation and then they have to give notice so that the employers can if necessary hire like agency workers to ensure that minimum service is continued rather than actually saying you specifically tim my nurse have to come back to work so yeah it's not quite the same at the moment your whole organization has to vote for the strike in the first place to go on it so you can have certain hospitals where there's a lot of nurses and doctors striking 
But then that doesn't mean that every hospital in in the country is going on strike. Yeah. So already there's ways in which the the disruption service is really watered down by that. Um, and essentially, they're, they're here legislating for something that already exists in their rhetoric. They're legislating to make sure people don't die. Really, already unions and doctors make sure people don't die when they're planning the strikes. Yeah, of course. The other argument, on, especially on the NHS, is that minimum service levels are only just being maintained when people aren't on strike because of the terrible working conditions, the staff shortages, and all of that relates to the issues that the staff have that they're expressing through their industrial action. So people are already being put in danger by massive waiting times when like, if you arrive in a hospital in an ambulance, you have to wait for hours because there there's no beds or there's no one to take you in or whatever, or there aren't enough nurses. That already is putting people in danger, but it's nothing to do with the strike. So it's kind of disingenuous for the government to make this kind of emotional appeal to say, oh, we need to stop putting people in danger and have this minimum service level set when they're already putting people in danger. Like people in the NHS care probably the most about making sure that people are safe when they, you know, when they need medical treatment. Of course. Yeah. And as, as I said, that comes into part of their reasons for striking their demands. Yeah. So the other Tory line that they've taken about all the industrial action and like when pressed on what pay rise they might agree to, without fail, they always say that's a matter for the independent pay review bodies, as if there is some like magical system whereby a completely independent force decides how much nurses should be paid and the Tory government just has to respect that. That is not true at all. So a pay review body is essentially a panel of experts from the sector who get together to make a recommendation about what a fair pay rise would be for people in the public sector. About 50% of public sector workers have their pay rise suggested by these pay review bodies. Whilst the government would like to say that they're completely independent, the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State for each area chooses the chair of these panels And before they are asked to make a decision, the government sends them a letter basically informing them of the remit of what they need to achieve. So, for example, this year, they've sent letters to all the pay review bodies emphasizing the constraints that the government is under in terms of trying to deal with inflation and like that there isn't much public money, which is just essentially what the government would be saying if they would have sat directly around the table with unions negotiating, which is, you know, it's a fair point, but it's also not fair to say that that's completely independent of the government because they're kind of setting the remit of what these pay review bodies have to do. Mm. And also the government does not have to follow the suggestions of these pay review bodies as they are saying that they have to do at the moment because it's convenient for them to say that. In the past, they've been very happy to ignore these recommendations when the recommendations were too high than what they wanted. So for example, in 2014, Jeremy Hunt, when he was the health secretary, did not accept the recommendations for the NHS pay review body because he thought their suggestions would be unaffordable. Around the strikes, there are some talking points that you'll always find swirling around. A lot of people who are a bit older will remember the 1970s as a time of massive dissatisfaction in the country. It was a time when labor were in power. It was a time when we had far more um, unionized workers. There was a lot of inflation, so people's money was worth less. The unions had a lot of power to demand a higher wage for their workers, which they which they could get. They had a lot more bargaining power back then than they do now. So then the workers' wages went up, and then manufacturers, noticing that there were the consumers were having more purchasing power, set their prices higher then the unions could strike again and give the the workers higher wages. So what you see is this sort of interplay between prices constantly rising and wages constantly rising to match them. So we were death locked in this spiral for quite a long time, where essentially inflation then got to, when we talk about inflation at the moment is in its 40 year peak, that last peak was the 70s. So whenever you talk about this with older people, certainly um, they will probably bring up the 70s as a time to say, you know, if people are all striking and demanding a higher wage, if we give them that higher wage, who knows what the economic consequence of that will be? We don't want to get into that situation again. So I think it's worth saying that we we don't really operate in the same environment as then. So first of all, 
far less people are unionized. They can cause disruption and they can negotiate higher wages, but they don't have that power anymore to sow massive wage increases across the whole of the UK. They're very much concentrated in the public sector and they're very much concentrated even within that, within certain professions. So I think that argument really doesn't have any weight on this. Um, Even, I think I looked into an article by the who is that research institution who um, who Liz Truss loves and she used all their policies? Oh, the IEA. Institute. The IEA, yeah. The Institute Economic of Economic Affairs, Affairs. Yeah. yes. So obviously their paper's written from like a conservative perspective on this whole thing. But they are saying in their paper, there's very little chance of a 1970s wage price spiral. But they're arguing it more from the perspective of, don't worry about these strikes. They don't mean anything. <laughs> Because yeah. they, they wrote that paper back in, it was like mid, so summer last year, 2022. And that was the time when I think the rail the rail workers had announced they were going to strike. But we hadn't had that um, cascade of all the other industries then. So I guess at that time, the, indus- the, the agenda was downplay it. It doesn't matter. Let's get on with running the country and not pay attention to the strikers, yeah. basically. So they were arguing from the perspective of don't give them a wage, in- wage increase. They can't do that much. Yeah, but I think it, it debunks that talking point that that you'll hear a lot. So Jeremy Hunt has argued that raising pay for all public sector workers in line with inflation would cost taxpayers about 28 billion if we were to do that this year, which he says would cost households a thousand pounds each. But what do you think about that, Tim? I'm going to defer to this guy that I found in an article I read. (laughs) who I assume is like, uh, I assume is cleverer than me because he's an economist. So Ben Zaranko, who's part of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, says that even if we use Sunak's methodology, those figures of uh, taxpayers being costed 28 billion are wrong. It's quite difficult to discern the details, but essentially what he's saying is that the government has already priced in a rise of 3%. So the extra cost isn't the full 28 billion that Jeremy Hunt is suggesting it is. But the excess of what they've already got priced in. Yeah, exactly. So if you think that inflation is at 9.2, they've already priced in a 3% rise. He was saying 28 billion. Ben Zaranko is saying it would actually be more like 18 billion if you're going on that, um, if you're going on those numbers. And then even additional to that, if you then factor in the fact that more taxes would be generated from the increases in wages, the yeah. figure comes down even lower. So we get more down to around 10 billion in that. Because obviously about 30% of your net salary goes towards tax and VAT and whatever, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah. It, the idea that it's going to cost 28 billion to the taxpayer outright is not, it's disingenuous. It, it's basically a figure that factors in only certain inputs and negates any of the benefits that could come with a wage. So basically all of the negative externalities, none of the benefits. To use an example of a similar way that's been done in the past, this is very much like when during the Brexit campaign, when they had put on the side of the bus, £350 million pounds a week, we're going to be able to put that into the NHS, which is like, you find the biggest number that you can find, even if it's not you know, if it's only tangentially related to reality, mm. and then that's what you use as the headline when you go and speak to the papers, but they're not being completely honest. The other thing that I always think with these, you know, when politicians throw out big figures, think of it like this, a million pounds is an insane amount to the average person, but you lose sight of the fact that government are playing with a budget of a trillion. So it, it seems a lot, yes, but when we're talking in terms of like the national economy and where money goes to, how much is spent versus how much is gained, even the low billions is still wiggle room the government has to lose. Yeah. The final figure that we were looking at that Ben Zaranko suggested was that the cost would be about 8.5 billion if we were to give all public sector workers an inflation level pay rise. But I don't think that anyone is really expecting the unions to come out of this situation with an actual inflation level pay rise across the board. So we're probably looking at a figure a little bit less than 8.5 billion. That is still a significant government cost, but it is also a cost that the government has to pay in order to keep services running. The government's main function in terms of public services is as an employer, right? If the wages that you're giving are not enough to attract enough talent 
into those pools to be able to get enough workers to keep ambulances going, keep teachers in classes, then you've failed as an employer. Mm. And also, yeah, so like coming back to what you said, so the inflation level, like pay increase would be like what, around 10% or or 9% or slightly, slightly below. I think at the moment what's on the table is the rail workers started off with the demand of 18%, but then they've been taken down quite far. I think the government then put in 5%. From 5% to the inflation level figure, there's a lot of wiggle room there already. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of puts it into perspective. The fact that, yeah, the amount of money they, they're saying is going to come out is probably not going to come to fruition. Yeah. And it's obviously like when you're negotiating, you don't just say immediately the thing that you expect to come out with, right? If you're the unions, you're obviously going to say something higher. Yeah. And I think part of the reason for that is because real wages in the public sector in the last 10 years have fallen against inflation. So whilst people have been getting incremental pay rises, they haven't kept up with inflation for like the last 10 years. So since 2010, NHS nurses have experienced a real terms wage cut of 8%. Imagine that you are getting paid £3,000 less on a salary of 35 grand. More than 50% of teachers have experienced a 13% fall in real wages since 2010. So this is why unions are asking for more than inflation at the moment is because what they're saying is we've already lost out over the last 10 years and now we're losing out by that amount again. So we need a big pay rise. And understandably, the government are saying we can't afford to give you all of that. And they're working out something in the middle. I mean, I imagine that the successful unions will probably walk away with something like seven or eight percent. Yeah, I think so. That's what I, that's what we can expect if it goes the way the unions want. Um and I think part of part of what's missing from the cost equations as well is the fact that there's an immovable there's an immovable pillar of conservative policy, which is we don't raise taxes. You know, if you raise taxes, for example, for for all the high income earners, um, you then have the extra money to cover the to cover the wage increase. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if people people who are doing fine at the moment who are not struggling to pay heating or grocery bills, of which I would call myself one of those people. I always think if the solution to giving people who are struggling the money they need is to tax me more money, that seems kind of fair to me because I'm having I'm not having to make those horrible decisions. And it it, it seems completely logical to me to do that. But conservatives will never raise taxes because it's part of their ideology that that's the worst thing they could possibly do. Yeah. Um, they also have now, you know, banks could raise interest rates. Part of the reason we got out of the 1970s crisis was um, Margaret Thatcher gave the banks the power to raise interest rates on their own so they could have some control over inflationary currents of the market. Again, that's not being talked about as a solution because, again, we do- they don't want banks to raise interest rates. That's already been a big problem for them. Yeah, because it would affect people with mortgages, right? Yeah, protecting people who've got more money and don't really have problems because like, we don't want, you know, homeowners... Uh, to pay even if they're living in really really nice homes we don't want them to pay any more money on those homes so the 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 sacrifice for that will be we don't give public sector sort of nurses a higher wage yeah which is you know it's fine until you need a nurse isn't it and there aren't (laughs) yeah i think that's why you can look at this as if if they were to give everyone in the public sector let's say a 20 percent pay increase that would be ridiculous. And that would be, that would be completely ridiculous. And I would, I would side with the people who say, well, that is actually, you know, they're taking the piss a bit there with that, with that pay increase because it goes way beyond inflation. So it doesn't really make sense. But it, it's a political choice not to give them the amount that, that tops them up to the level of some, somewhere near inflation, even if it's not actual inflation level. Mm. As we mentioned before, especially in the NHS, a lot of the strikes also relate to working conditions. It's not just about pay for them. It's also about the fact that every time they go in for a shift, it's understaffed. They're having to do ridiculous amounts of work. They have to stay for two hours after their shift and they're not getting paid for that. And because of that, we are seeing a large exodus of people from the NHS. More than 34,000 nurses left their role over the last 12 months, which is an increase of 25% on the previous year. So In my opinion, it's inevitable that the government is going to have to strike a deal that works for the nurses and as a knock-on effect, most other public sector workers as well, because the government can't afford politically 
for things not to work for an extended period of time. They're already doing so bad in the polls. If people go for long stretches of time where they really can't get a hospital appointment or they really are struggling to access public services, that's just not gonna work. They'll get voted out. So, we've talked about the Tories. And... Ooh! <laughs> kidding, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I love the Tories. Shout out Tories. I'm not, I, I was just being, I was just being a kidder. A little prank. That's good that you've managed to remain very impartial there. <laughs> um, so what do Labour suggest? I think that's the next big question. Boo! Impartial. <laughs> I'm impartial. I boo everyone. You've got total integrity. He'll boo anyone. Um, I'll boo the nurses. <laughs> Please don't be the nurses on the podcast. We'll be cancelled. I mean, I'll boo every single person. I'd like. We'll I see be like, a, and we'll also be outcast from our own friendship group, which includes nurses. We had to completely erase our children with leukemia episode because I just kept booing every single every <laughs> single child we discussed on that on that show. So Labour have said that they would repeal this new strike legislation if they win the next election. Sama said he doesn't think that legislation is the way you bring it into industrial disputes is likely to make a bad situation worse. He's also said that he would get around the negotiating table to with unions. This is not just Starmer. This is like all the Labour MPs yeah, have been asked. It's, it's get the around, line, isn't it? Get around the table. We, I think we can imagine. I think we can, no, we can reliably say that, that there's been some sort of memo circulated. That yes. The line is get round the table. <laughs> yeah. And if they try and pin you into a specific claim, get off, get off, get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> the specific claim I'm making is that I would be at the table with my family. <laughs> yes. So whenever they've been pressed on exact figures, they have refused to give an exact number of how much, of what percentage they think would be a fair pay rise for different public sector workers. I'd be 100% getting around the table. That's the percentage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you want a percentage? 110% I'm around that table, mate. I'm 110% there. Um, I actually think... Although some uh, on the left might see this as a bit of weakness in not tackling the Tories hard enough on this, I think this is quite a clever move because if Labour were to give a specific number, they're then pegged to that like until the next election. So whatever the outcome is, whatever the successful negotiation is, they're pegged to that specific number. And the Tory press are going to take that number and find the worst possible reading of this it. Is, this is what I was about to say. So they'd say that that 9% increase would see you, the taxpayer, not be able to give your kids any food for the next year because it would yeah. cost you like 50 billion pounds. And it's true. Like they would, they would find every single like extrapolation. And they, but that. they wouldn't. So they would, for example, if we we're talking about that 28 billion that Jeremy Hunt suggested, they would run that, you know, they would say, Keir Starmer wants to cost you, the taxpayer, £28 billion. Yeah. And that's going to cost you individually £1,000. Yeah. So I think it's very smart of Labour to just say that they would be working more closely with the unions and probably, that I feel like the implication is, would offer probably a better deal to public sector workers. But I think they've been, yeah, smart not to give an exact number. Well, I think the whole, it, there's the fundamental difference I see. When I, I watch a lot of um, internet debates, and I hate seeing people be uh, weaselly. So if it was a debate and I was seeing someone who's um, on the left argue for um, for the position of, you know, I think we should agree to a pay increase, it would annoy me to not see them anchored to a percentage. But there's, there's, there's an inherent difference between the somewhat uh, an individual and, and assessing their line of thinking and how straight they're being versus a politician who, as you say, everything could cause it. It's more damage. It's more damage reduction, isn't it? And it's also that like Labour are trying to present themselves as a viable alternative for actual government. And it would not be a good negotiation tactic to tell the press outside of the negotiation what number you were hoping to pay as the pay rise, because then the union is going to use that as their starting point. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So yeah, I don't. I I feel that's okay. What would you? What would? What percentage would you say? I'm intrigued to know. Well, the RMT have said that they were looking for a minimum of seven percent, mm. and I think that sounds fair. Like I think maybe seven point five eight percent. It's you know that is still below inflation, but it it would be very affordable. 
it would be, I think, something like 5 billion cost to the taxpayer if public sector workers were going to have like a 8% pay raise or something. So I feel that that's, that's the sort of thing where the government could find that money without too much difficulty. That's, that's the same thing. I know they've got like a really small, to be expected, they've got a really small headroom in their budget for mm. any wage increases, which you can completely expect. I think they would find it if if the percentage was. So my whole thoughts on when I heard the negotiations, I thought 18% increase is kind of crazy. But <laughs> that was like the RMT's initial number. I was like, there's no way they can afford that. But similar to you, I was thinking at like around 9%, something below the actual inflation level, but it, it approaches it, right? Part of the problem is that pay rises in the public sector have been so below inflation for so many years that we've now got a cumulative effect where nurses at the bottom end of the pay spectrum are struggling to make ends meet because their pay has declined so much over the years. If they were kept up, you know, to within a small, a, you know, just a bit less than inflation every year, we wouldn't be in this, we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in. So... Yeah, yeah, I think as long as as long as if it's if it's going to be, you know, a percentage point below inflation this year, I would want it to see it also increased substantially each year that we do have high inflation. Mm. Well, I've I've seen a lot of this sort of divide like divide and conquer tactics really have quite a big effect on certain people I work with. Um someone brought up to me when we talked about the rail strike, they said they said the average rail worker is earning 45 grand. And uh, that was like, I think that was a Grant Sh- Shapps quote there. Right. And inherently what that does is if your salary is less than that, you think, why the hell are they striking? I have less than that and I'm fine. But I think masked into that average, I think even if you calculate the people who are actually on strike, it's not all the rail, it's not all the rail workers, it's the people who are very much below that level of pay. A lot yeah. of the cleaners, for example, you can't imagine the, I don't think the cleaners who clean the trains are on 45 grand. Um, and the similar with all the other industries, especially nurses. Like if we, it, it seems really absurd to me that we have nurses working round the clock shifts with like people's relatives who might be mentally ill, really difficult job, really like hard going. And they're on like 20 grand. That seems insane. Yeah. Well, it's like, did you see, um, Rishi Sunak did an interview with Laura um, Laura Quensberg or Koonsberg or Laura Koonsberg, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and she asked him, "Would you do a carer's job? Would you be a carer for eighteen grand a year?" And he said, "Well, my job is very important. I'm the prime minister. I'm I'm like already doing a public service by being the prime minister. And it's like clearly you would not do that job. Obviously not." I would not do that job, 18 grand a year to be a carer. But clearly we need those, we really need carers. And it's a job that is pretty difficult with a lot of responsibility. And part of the reason that the NHS is in such a mess is because we don't have the care provision. When people leave hospital, they still need care, but it's just the hospital is no longer the right place for them. Like the worst part of their health experience is over, but they still need care to make sure that they're kept alive. And that falls into the you know health and social care industry often with like older people. Obviously, we're struggling to retain people who look after those people if they're only being paid 18 grand a year. Like that's just not mm, enough. Yeah. Well, also, I think it, it also has this knock on effect on like the, the workforce in care. You get a lot of people in care who you meet and you're like, you're a carer and it's, be- <laughs> it's a surprise, right? Because, because obviously at those, at those salary levels, it's often people who, you know, they've, they've come out of other places. They don't necessarily want to be carers, but it's the place where they most desperately need staff. So they'll take them. And yeah. so it, it, the, it, it's linked into a lot of other issues of, you know, the level of service in care and everything, because they're not retaining like the, the ta- you know, the actual talent in care who are the people who are, super empathetic, um, really knowledgeable about different like conditions, mm-hmm. really good with people who have like different developmental disorders and all that kind of thing, because, you know, they're just good people. They're good people, people. Yeah. You get a lot of carers who aren't like that, but it's because of that, uh, the same problems we've discussed. It's the root of like a lot of the the failings of the healthcare system um, is is the poor salaries that we're offering people who are you know brave enough or, or caring enough to want to go into it. 100%. So 
a little little parting thought for you here. At the end of the 1970s, Margaret Thatcher came to power, essentially on a platform of you know, tackling the unions. She introduced loads of new legislation to crack down on unions, which eventually led to a rise in the use of employment tribunals as opposed to like industrial action to deal with dispute. And as union membership declined, income inequality massively surged. So maybe everyone should join a union. Maybe we should join a union, yeah. Yeah, the situation we've seen this year has shown, in spite of the fact that unions are represent less of the population than they did before, we have seen through these strikes what can be achieved. We've now got the government coming up and saying that they will go to the table with the rail strikers after nine months of fighting them. Yeah. It shows you there is still some power there, and I guess the, the note of optimism against the horrible entering of the bill that we don't like, that forces them to have a minimum service level that, that curbs their ability, is that through persistence, these people have been able to show everyone that change can be achieved. 100%. Okay, cool. That's us for today. That's unions, that's strikes, that's the minimum service level bill. So thanks for listening to another episode of Jumping Off Points. I felt like we went quite serious today. We got very like very political you know very normally social we're... justice-y I, yeah. say. I, I do if you get me get me as drunk as i am today <laughs> i will start becoming more and more left <laughs> maybe it's because i haven't been drinking this month so that's what's you know it's really focused my mind on unions and fair pay i'd, I'd say it's nice to see a more serious side of you personally <laughs> seem like you're very on it with knowing your facts and whizzing up and down that document with your notes <laughs> You were more focused, actually. You should give up probably, drinking forever, bro. Probably too focused. I need to get back into drinking. <laughs> I was about to say. No, you were very on it, whizzing up and down the documents. So maybe, you know, maybe there's maybe there's something there for you to consider, Aiden. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Jumping off the... Jumping off the...